My name is Clay Pierce. I'm with the uh, U.S. Geological Survey and uh, Iowa uh, Cooperative Fish and Wildlife Research Unit, <coughs> unit here at Iowa State. Um, and um, along with uh, Keith Schilling from the Iowa Geological Survey, uh, we're co-organizing -org this session on, I uh, on oxbows, this track of oxbows, three consecutive presentations this session, uh, the next session, and then after the long break, a third session. We're all going to be here in Benton Auditorium, so we have the big stage, and I appreciate you all uh, coming. Um, uh, these sessions are going to be a little different than a, a typical Iowa Water Conference uh, presentation. We're going to have two or three presentations during each session, so I hope you enjoy the kind of controlled chaos of uh, speakers coming and going off the podium rather quickly, and I hope you also appreciate the diversity of talks and, and speakers. Um, this presentation, uh, we're just uh, hoping to kind of get things started, and now with a little bit less time, I'm going to try to go quickly and introduce Oxbows, a little bit about Oxbows, their origins, uh, some of the issues they face, um, and some of the, the potentials for, uh, for uh, their contributions in the future. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, Keith Schilling, uh, seated here, will, will help with this presentation, and he helped organize this and help recruit some of the speakers. Okay, let's see. It, there we go. All right. It looks, sorry about that. It looks good here. It looks like it's good on the screen at this point. Okay. So, what are oxbows? I think most of you know that oxbows are the U shaped bodies of water uh, found in, in river floodplains, along streams, along rivers, uh, found throughout the world. Um, the word oxbow comes from agriculture. Uh, it's the U-shaped piece of metal that's part of an oxyoke that helps uh, uh, keep the, the team of oxen together. Uh, so it has kind of an interesting, um, uh, interesting origin and kind of interesting the way that, uh, that, that we see oxbows now often in our, uh, out in our agricultural landscapes. Uh, in other places in the world, oxbows have different names. Probably the most familiar one to people are the billabongs of Australia. Uh, down in South Texas along the Rio Grande River, uh, they're referred to as resacas, and there's a picture of a billabong there on the top and a beautiful resaca uh, on the bottom photo there. Um, how are oxbows created? I wonder if this is going to work. Sure enough, uh, my little simulation is working. Um, so you probably, uh, you, you, you may know, have known this already, but oxbows are kind of a, they're, they're part of that um, evolutionary River plain, uh, floodplain, river uh, morphology, geomorphology, where uh, erosion causes the, um, the 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 branches of a uh, of a meander to to migrate closer and closer together. Erosion finally cuts through, uh, uh, resulting in a cutoff and a shortening of the the, the channel uh, carrying the flow, and the leftover portion that is eventually uh, cut off from the flow. Uh, is the oxbow remaining. And so that's, a, that's called a neck cutoff, and that's the most common uh, method um, of oxbow formation. Uh, and here's a, a series of photos that illustrates that pretty nicely. This is on the Brazos River in South Texas. And here's an aerial photo of that river, in, or that, uh, a bend in that river, um, in uh, 1943, showing uh, uh, a very strong meander with a relatively narrow neck and that neck has become much more narrow uh, by 1995. And you can see that neck is, looks like it's about ready to be cut off. Uh, by 2004, it looked like this. Uh, there was a cutoff, but there was still a little bit of a connection. Um, and then by 2006, there was complete, uh, complete isolation of that oxbow from the river channel. And that's the, that's the evolution of a, of a typical um, oxbow that's naturally created. There is another mechanism called shoot cutoff, um, and that's illustrated in the bottom diagram there. The top diagram is the, is the typical neck cutoff, and, and you can see that compared to the, the previous slides. The bottom diagram shows a shoot cutoff, and it's really kind of a short circuiting of the neck cutoff process. It happens more quickly. Um, there's a, 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 lo a lower diversion angle in that cutoff and the, 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 where the, the water is, uh, is diverted 
Um, typically found in higher gradient streams, um, very extreme flow events, and um, also if the, the material in the neck um, is, is highly erodible. So those are two natural uh, oxbow uh, formation, um, I guess, mechanisms, if you will, and um, uh, um, uh, an artificial mechanism that creates a lot of oxbows and oxbow-like uh, water bodies uh, here in the Midwest and certainly here in Iowa is stream straightening. Here's an example of that. So um, in the, uh, the left photo uh, taken in the 1930s, uh, this is uh, Otter Creek in the Boone River water, uh, watershed. And you see a nice kind of natural looking meandered stream. Um, and the right photo, same place, but taken in, in 2015, um, you now see a straightened stream that, that has been channelized uh, through that area of, of meanders. Um, some of those meanders are still evident and those uh, can become sort of artificial oxbows. Many of those will disappear through filling, through cultivation, uh, but, uh, but some of them remain and, and some of them are, are, are potential uh, locations for restoration and you're going to be hearing about that in at least a couple of the upcoming talks. So uh, where are oxbows found? They're found throughout the world. Uh, they're a worldwide phenomenon uh, in, uh, in floodplain rivers. And uh, so here's an example uh, of an oxbow from um, Malaysia. And uh, really kind of a similar looking picture from Alaska. Um, there's pictures like this of oxbows uh, throughout the world. Uh, and of course, uh, close to home here in Iowa, we have many, many uh, small uh, oxbows on prairie streams. Uh, in Iowa. And, and, and although the majority of the talks and the emphasis in this session, these upcoming sessions are going to be on oxbows like this, um, I think what we're learning about oxbows, um, both from the conservation side and nutrient side, um, and we even heard about oxbows at, at lunch, so that was kind of a, a benefit that I, I didn't see coming. Um, anyway, a lot of these things I think uh, are applicable potentially worldwide um, as we learn more and more about the about oxbows. Well, how big can oxbows be? Um, the largest oxbow in North America is Lake Chicot uh, in Arkansas. It's about 10,000 acres. A uh, large body of water, as you can see there, Lake Chicot was uh, formed about 600 years ago uh, with a net cutoff event of the Mississippi River. How small can they be? Well, um, there's a small oxbow that we worked on uh, a few years ago in North Central Iowa. Easily weightable. You could almost jump across that. I couldn't, but maybe some of you could. Um, and uh, that uh, shows you the range and sizes. So they're really quite a, a ubiquitous uh, feature on our landscape. Uh, the future of oxbows, um, there are many threats, and you're going to be hearing about those. Uh, there are many benefits, and you're definitely going to be hearing about those. And I think also because of that, there's a lot of reason for optimism for um, the promotion and use and wise management of oxbows uh, as we go into the future. And, and all of these things are going to be uh, discussed by upcoming uh, pre uh, presentations. So just to kind of mention one pretty obvious one, you're going to be hearing a lot about the conservation benefits of oxbows. We know, and you could probably you could probably guess um, that oxbows are great habitat for a, a wide variety of species. Things like fish, amphibians, and birds are um, abundant in oxbows, but that's not to leave out some of the other important taxa. Many, many taxa of aquatic invertebrates use oxbows. Of course, mammals use them, and, and so um, they're uh, an important habitat out there. Um, and one of the species that uh, you're going you're gonna to hear talks about, and, and maybe you know about this a little bit about this story already, the Topeka Shiner um, is, a, is a, a common resident of oxbows in, in some places in Iowa and other, in other states. Topeka Shiners are native to six Midwestern states. Iowa is one of those uh, states that has them. Uh, they were federally listed as endangered in 1998. Their original slow water habitat because of land use, because of agricultural practices and stream straightening and a variety of, of things, uh, that, that original slow water habitat that used to be abundant is now uh, not very abundant. And oxbows have become sort of a surrogate for that uh, in, in many places. And there's a growing body of research that's demonstrating how important that is. Uh, oxbows are to Topeka shiners. And, and again, you're going to be hearing about some of that. 
So now what I want to do is real quickly um, kind of shift gears and uh, give you uh, some short vignettes of some of the talks that are upcoming. Um, and then Keith Schilling is going to come up and, and do the same for some of the talks that he recruited. So Alicia Kenny is here and she's going to be presenting next. She's uh, been a leader. She's with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and she's been a leader in uh, um, oxbow restorations and Topeka Shiner conservation for many years. And she's going to be giving a, a, an overview of the rationale and history and experiences and successes from uh, 17 years of oxbow restorations for Topeka Shiner habitat uh, in Iowa. Um, then uh, starting out the, the next session after the, the short break, uh, Nick Simpson um, is going to talk. He's a grad student uh, here in the um, uh, uh, the NREM department of Iowa State University and he's going to be presenting on habitat and fish assemblages associated with the presence and abundance of Topeka shiners and oxbows and, he, and his talk is going to emphasize the differences between restored and unrestored oxbows. Um, then Alex Bible in that session is, uh, is also a grad student. He's going to be talking about his work looking at genetic analysis to compare populations of Topeka shiners um, in oxbows and streams and to estimate their genetic diversity and degree of connectedness. Um, and then uh, to finish out that, uh, that second session, Courtney Zambori, uh, another grad student here at Iowa State, is going to talk about her GIS analysis using LIDAR uh, to develop a process for identifying candidate sites for oxbow restoration and her landscape level uh, Topeka Shiner distribution models. Okay, now I'm going to turn over the podium to my co-organizer, Keith Schilling, and he's going to talk about uh, nutrients and some uh, of the speakers in the final session. Thanks, Clay. Um, so in addition to the ecological benefits that Clay was talking about, I think um, uh, an increasingly recognized um, benefit of oxbows and associated practices of, in stream restoration is what can what sort of nutrient reduction benefits are these uh, uh, created environments resulting in? Um, we're all aware from talks last night and this morning that you know uh, nutrients are a real issue in the Midwest. I mean, if you look at the map um, of the Mississippi River Basin, Iowa is like the epicenter of nutrient issues. So um, more and more work is being done to recognize um, the, the need for development of new strategies to reduce nutrients. And one of the things we're looking at, um, we've got a small population so far, but we're, we're, we're uh, doing work to recognize and study and, and quantify the nutrient reduction benefits of oxbows themselves. Um, so there's just this constant need to come up with new and innovative strategies. And what we're going to talk about later in this session is uh, uh, the quantification of the effectiveness of oxbows for nutrient reduction, specifically nitrate reduction. So our population so far is like, uh, you know, N equals two. We've got two sites that we've done a lot of work on, one on the Des Moines Lobe and one in eastern Iowa. One is uh, a site that receives uh, nutrient inputs from tile drainage that feeds directly into the oxbow. The other one is a um, um, perhaps a more traditional oxbow that receives a nutrient input from flooding. And so there's some interesting um, similarities and important differences between the loads coming into an oxbow with tile drainage versus the loads delivered to the oxbow with flooding. And so uh, presentation that I'll have in uh, concurrent session C after the long, longer break is uh, comparing and contrasting really the nutrient reduction benefits of these two different oxbow systems, one with tile drainage and one without tile drainage and fed by flooding. Um, so that's the uh, first talk. So the, the session, concurrent session C will involve uh, three talks uh, related to the nutrient reduction benefits with my, my focus being on uh, the site specific results of two sites. We're going to start working to scale that up a little bit. Keegan Colt from the Soybean Association is on next after myself uh, to talk about how to integrate oxbow restorations in terms of watershed plans. Um, uh, the Soybean Association has been very involved uh, with other partners, including the Nature Conservancy, to, to get oxbows 
uh, part of uh, longer term big picture strategies for, uh, for watershed plans. Keegan will uh, talk about some of that. And our session will conclude with uh, Chris Jones from the University of Iowa, uh, who's going to present uh, even the biggest picture of all is how does oxbows, how do oxbows fit within uh, the agricultural context? You know, how do uh, agricultural producers view them? How are they, uh, how do they function in terms of this big picture uh, commercial agriculture across the state in the Midwest? So I think with our three talks, we'll kind of scale from uh, small localized uh, settings to watershed context to uh, the Midwest and the industrial agriculture that we have. So I think those will be an interesting uh, collection of speakers uh, that follow more of the conservation benefits and the ecological benefits that uh, Clay has recruited. So we'd finally like just uh, acknowledge and, and invite Alicia to come up on her presentation. Uh, there's been many agencies involved with uh, funding Oxbow projects and, and what you're seeing today is really this a testament to all the different agencies that have contributed. This is a, an entirely group effort as you can see from this collection of uh, talks today. Um, and we appreciate the conference organizers for allowing us to like package all these into a session and uh, um, look forward to uh, 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 presenting and, and hearing about all the interesting work that's being done. So with that, uh, Alicia can come up and we can stay on schedule. I mean, we're here for, you know, we're here for questions, but you know, it was so general, I'm sure that was, everybody's aware of everything we have going on here, so. Are there any questions? All right, good. All right, thanks guys. <clears throat> so my name's Alicia Kenny, and, and like I said, I work for a Fish and Wildlife Service out of Moline. Um, our office has been working on Topeka Shiner restoration since 2001, and I took them over in 2008. And so what I'm going to be presenting on to kind of kick off this Oxbow Symposium is um, why we started restoring them in the first place, some of the, um, the benefits and stuff that we've seen come out of that, and then at the end I'm going to go over some of the lessons learned from this. So anytime you work with these projects, uh, you, you, you learn stuff as you go, and I'm going to try to tell you some stuff that you should do, and then some things that we learned that you shouldn't do. Uh, so we're all familiar that land use in Iowa has changed drastically, and because of that, um, the area that I work in, the Des Moines lobe of Iowa, um, there's the oxbow restoration opportunities up there just everywhere. And so that picture on the right, you can see um, the little oxbow scars. Uh, if you use a 2008 uh, ortho photo, you can see these, uh, that was a wet year, so you can see these oxbow scars sticking out pretty easily. And uh, Courtney's talk later will kind of show you how we pick out which ones that we want to restore. I'm going to skip over this because Clay did a great job of explaining what oxbows are. And so the reason that we started doing these restorations was for the federally endangered Topeka Shiner. So our office is an endangered species office. Um, Topeka Shiner is one that felt well underneath of the hat of, of projects that we were looking at. Uh, Topeka Shiners prefer, prefer slow moving pools of water. They were a true prairie fish. They didn't like the fast moving flow of, that we have now. During floods, they enter out into the oxbow. Um, and then they'll stay there and they'll spawn in there and live there until the next flood either reconnects that oxbow with the stream and then they get reintroduced back into the stream or until that oxbow eventually dries up. Um, a lot of the oxbows that we have now will not support fish over winter uh, or even through the summer. And so a lot of them will go out and will stay in and collect fish in them. Um, like this example, this oxbow had uh, over 250 Topeka Shiners in it when we sampled it the last week of May. I came out the second week of June and this is what it looked like. And so you walked up to that little hole of water and all, you just see the fish and they're struggling. And then you come back a week later and they're gone. And so this is what we were constantly running into with this fish. So we decided that we were going to restore these oxbows. Um, in 2002, the first oxbow restorations took place in Iowa. And um, what happened was we received some recovery dollars for Topeka Shiners, and we got $250,000 to do recovery work. And so at that time, little was known about Topeka Shiner habitat. So we spent a whole bunch of money doing this big in-stream work where we were putting in plunge pools and, and riffles and restoring all the, the, the stream bed and, and uh, protections and all that stuff. And we had $50,000 left over from all that work, and there were four oxbow scars on that site. It's like, well, what the heck? We'll just dig them out because it's pretty cheap to do. So we came back and we sampled all over in that in-stream area and we found zero Topeka Shiners and then all four of the oxbows had them in them. So then it was the light bulb moment. Okay, so this is what works for this fish. So that kind of spurred this effort. Um, from 2002 to 2016, we restored 65 of them. 
Uh, that was in the North Raccoon River watershed prim primarily. Um, and then, uh, beginning in 2010, I want to say, we started bringing in the Nat Nature Conservancy and Iowa Soybean Association, and we started targeting the Boone River watershed. And um, so now we're up to 17 plus on going into that one. The Boone River stuff started focusing on the nitrate reduction, um, which is what Keith was alluding to that you're going to hear some talks about later. So we started incorporating both these benefits. So we know these things are great fish nurseries, and uh, now we're starting to put tile line into them and start to do some nutrient reduction as well. Um, 2016. I started doing some of these restorations in non-Topeka Shiner streams. So like Clay alluded to, uh, we focus so much on Topeka Shiners, but these things have so many benefits to them. And honestly, as far as restoration goes, they're pretty cheap to install. So um, I've done these outside of Shiner streams. I've gotten calls from a, a guy in um, Arkansas that works on alligator gar that wants to do restorations using oxbows because they like that same type of habitat. I did a talk for some folks in Ontario that were interested in doing oxbow restoration. So it doesn't have to be just Topeka Shiner focused. And so um, just remember that when I'm kind of going through some of the lessons learned. And so here's a, an oxbow pre-restoration. Um, if you look back, you can see the excavator in the back of that photo. That's where the stream is. Uh, and then um, to survey these, it's really easy. So you'll take a survey point in the stream on a nice cobbly area and then you'll take a survey point in the bottom of the oxbow bed. And whatever that difference is, is what we use for our estimation of fill to be removed. Usually in the Des Moines lobe of Iowa, it's three to sometimes five, couple cases, but up to six feet of sediment that you have to remove. And a lot of times this is some of Iowa's best topsoil. So we just take that and we put it right up in the farmer's field, he tills it in and we're good to go. The bad part for us is it really limits our timing and the window of when we can do these uh, restorations. This is what it looks like right after um, restoration, right after digging it out. And so you can see the glacial till, those big boulders that were still in there. I found that fascinating that you, you, know, you find those back in the stream. Um, with these, we play a lot with them. So trying to figure out what works best. So this one, that, that strip of dirt we left there as a vegetation strip to try to see if we could increase spawning habitat. And then once it's healed up, this is what it looks like. And um, there's only been one time that this has dried up um, out of all of them that we have. And that was 2012, 2013, when we had the severe drought in Iowa. And we lost every single one of them. But every other year out of that, we've had successful reproduction. And I've checked them in the winter. So I've went out with a camera in the winter, drilled a hole down, and you'll still see fish moving. And I think I went through 22 inches of ice and still saw fish moving in the bottom. Um, I'm going to skip over this one, but you can kind of see pre-restoration, post-restoration, and the yellow line in the bottom is uh, the 1938 aerial digitized. So these oxbows, they, they just, benefit-wise, there's just so many um, habitat benefits that come out of it. So they really are fish nurseries. Uh, a lot of these we do are a half acre or less in size, and we get tens of thousands of fish out of them. Um, many fish, including the Topeka Shiners, use them for spawning. Uh, one, eight, one half acre oxbow that we restored in Iowa off of West Butcher Creek, I sampled it um, in May and it had 26 adult Topeka Shiners in it. That stream did not reconnect, so that oxbow stayed disconnected. I sampled it again in September and I got over 800 juvenile Topeka Shiners. So you think now this thing's going to last throughout the winter, it's going to restock the stream, so the benefits are great there. We started wanting to look at this also for bird usage, um, just to kind of show that as another benefit. And so we put recorders out there and had Iowa Audubon Society process the calls for us. And they found 54 species of birds were using them, nine of which would not have been there if the oxbow had not restored. And many of those were species of greatest conservation need. And then what you'll hear about later, which I'm not gonna go too much into, but they're also great um, nitrate reducers. And then just the overall biomass and the ecological lift you get out of these things, you pull the same through there, it's fun. I mean, the stuff that you see come out of that, the tadpoles and the crawfish and the giant snapping turtles, that would not have been there had you not restored it, it's, just, it's, it's amazing. So here I get into the lessons learned from this. So depth matters, and uh, this goes for the fish mostly. So if you guys are wanting to do these for duck habitat, don't worry about this portion. But for Topeka shiners and fish in general, the depth matters. You have to get to that groundwater. So there's been several times where um, when we were first learning how to do this, we'd do our survey points and we'd say, oh, it's about three feet down to the cobble area, to the, you know, you're gonna hit your groundwater in there. And uh, so the, the excavator would dig down, the contractor would dig, and then he would hit what he thought was gravel, but it turned out it was an old sandbar in the stream and he'd stop. And then they were obviously too shallow and those were winter killing. So that groundwater is a must to obtain that ground or to obtain that overwinter. Too deep is bad for Topeka Shiners. So, so they ask a lot of contractors like, well, why can't I just dig them down deeper? If you get too deep, then the water stays cooler and then your predator fish will do better. And so if we keep it shallower and a little bit warmer, it's better for the minnows. 
Um, and then also what I throw at the contractors is our SHPO permit, permit only allows for post-settlement alluvium. So don't violate SHPO and go too deep. Size matters again. So this is just for Topeka Shiners or if you're doing this for the minnows. So less than a half acre is what we found is the best size. If you get bigger than that, again, you're gonna be getting too big, too cold, and your, your predators are gonna be doing really well. Uh, so we sained one that was way over my waders. I think all of us went over our waders on it and it was extremely wide and all we got was crappie, green sunfish and bullheads and some bass, zero minnows. Um, so in order to allevi alleviate that, we, um, this was a 1.4 acre oxbow. So we divided up into three, three tenths acre oxbows with a little connective channel between each one. So that way when it kind of recedes, they're all disconnected and that, and that water can warm up and do better for the shiners. Tree cover is a must for the fish as well. If you're worried about wood ducks, again, disregard this one. Uh, for fish, we say less than 50% tree cover and uh, less trees is gonna make the water warm again. And then it avoids your winter kills. So you're not gonna have all that leaf litter falling off into your oxbow, being covered by ice and snow, and then having the decay remove your oxygen. Uh, placement matters. So the one oxbow that we had fill in was just in the wrong spot, but I am not an engineer or a hydrogeomorphologist. I am just a biologist looking for a place to put oxbows. And so we put that oxbow on a bend where you had a lot of energy coming through and it ended up filling up with sediment. But overall, we've done some studies on these and they've, in, in 17 years, it's about three inches of deposition that's um, gone back into the oxbows. Land and air communication is your key on this. So we can't go in there saying that we're wanting to restore these things for a federally endangered species because they slammed the door shut on us. But if we go in there telling them that we're gonna give them a duck hunting habitat or that we're gonna give them a spot to go fishing because there are all kinds of neat fish that go into these, um, they're more likely to listen to us. And so selling on everything except for that endangered species that we wanna get that habitat benefit for. Um, we also allow grazing on these oxbow sites. So for us, it gets the cows out of the stream in the oxbows, they'll just kind of dip in a little bit, get a drink of water and come right back out. They won't stand in there. And we've done studies to show that the nutrient um, inputs coming from those cattle are not enough to harm the fish. So another selling point for us to get the landowner on board. Communicate your successes. And this is where our partners come in great. So um, the way to, to get more of these out there on the landscape is to find some of those landowners that take pride in that, in that restoration and put these signs up and just show that the many benefits that come out of this and try to get more people on board. This was a hard one to learn. Be there when the contractor digs. Uh, so um, always these things tend to happen on Friday nights. So I got a call that the contractor wanted to dig starting Saturday morning. I live four hours away from where these oxbows are. And he's like, ah, I, I see your plans. I know what I'm doing, I can do this. And it was another one of those where we told him, all right, well, you're gonna hit gravel, dig till you hit gravel and then keep that to get your groundwater. The next day, the landowner called me. He's like, something's wrong. This doesn't look right. And he sent me a picture. And I got up there, and the guy was just basically digging a big circle that was all two foot deep because he couldn't find the gravel. And so uh, we were able to fix that. So we have, I found the channel for him. And now, looking back, it's a really nice wetland on the edges of that, which kind of started us to do some wetlands on the edges. But um, an expensive lesson that was learned on my end because I had to pay for all that. And then lastly, um, when I started doing these restorations, the guy that was training me told me that this is 90% art, 10% science. If you hit your few key points that you need to achieve, the rest of it you can kind of play with. So like I said, those vegetation shelves, adding these wetlands, um, any of that that you think might be beneficial, none of it's gonna do any harm as long as you stick with those key um, necess necessities if you're dealing with something like the Topeka Shiner. Otherwise, just have fun with it and be creative. And hopefully I talked fast enough to get us a little bit back on track. Good. Any questions, or do you want to save questions for later? I'll be around the whole thing. There's time for a question or two. Okay. You guys got any questions for me? Don't yeah. The, don't the birds that you encourage cut down on your uh, shiners over there? So they're so rare. That's another question we get because we find crappies and stuff in these. They're so rare that the chances of them picking out that one minnow that we want, it's pretty, pretty low. The same thing, like uh, the landowners will sometimes want to go sane in there for bait fish. Go ahead. The chances you guys catch on these, pretty low. Yeah. Yes? Uh, no, so that would be different. I would probably not worry about fish habitat necessarily in something like that because you wouldn't want to completely lose all your water. But um, I haven't had to deal with that yet. Anybody else? Yes. So if you have a site, we have so many channelized streams, so we're looking at 
the options of doing stream restoration before it meanders, uh -huh. or we can possibly do some of these oxbows which don't have direct flow. Yep. Any experience on which, way, which direction to go or what balance that you're looking for? Uh, right. I guess it depends on what your your goal is. So fisheries wise, these seem to be doing a better benefit than for fisheries than just your in-stream work overall. I mean, your in-stream work is going to get some of your more game fish. So if you, it, it depends on what your goal is, I guess. But we can chat later about that if you if you have some ideas. Let's thank Alicia. All right, thank you.